Okay, everybody, let's continue where we left off. So, last time, we talked about development in a cycle, or a loop, or a iterative development process, okay? Which is this idea that we have to keep coming back to reevaluate our projects, okay? Now, this takes various forms. You can search, like, software development iterative cycle, and you will get lots of different versions of this, okay? The process of creating software in prototypes and beta testing and alpha testing has been done in some form all the way back to the 1970s. So this is not a new idea. But the basic process is, one, identify what our needs are. What do our users really need here? What are our requirements? From simple, what are the inputs and outputs? What's the information I need? What are the details? Is there security? Obviously, this can be a big list or a small list depending on the problem, but you need to know what the needs are. Two, start an initial prototype. This might just be a design prototype or it might be a slightly working version of your final project or your final design, but it should at minimum at least include something that the users interact with. Have them use that prototype and give you a review on it. So what did they like? What did they not like? What do you need to change? Get that feedback and then go back and redevelop the prototype, okay? So then using the feedback, you can improve the prototype and that might mean a completely different prototype or a modified prototype. And then this is where that iterative cycle comes in, okay? Now, as you do this, there's going to be negotiation. Because your client sometimes don't understand what's going on. So your client might have an unreasonable request of you. Well, can you add this feature? And you will have to negotiate. Well, no, but. And then you offer something else. So it is not just a you always do what the client wants necessarily. There is a negotiation in that process. Okay? But it's still, you can't leave the client out of it. You can't go, no client, you don't get that. You don't get that either. Because it, it's my program and you do what I say. You can't do that either. So it's a back and forth negotiation. Okay? The iterative system helps you find problems quickly and makes it easy to repair before you get too deep into your problem. Okay? It also might find new usability situations. So all of a sudden, by involving the user, a feature might be added that you hadn't thought of. Okay? It will teach you through messing up repetitively or iteratively until you get it right, resulting in a more successful final product, okay? And from a business standpoint, that actually results in much more cost-efficient production. Here is, I created five different, these are actual company designs of their iterative processes. Processes, actually, I think is the plural of process. Here we go. So here's one from an actual company. Create the prototype, share it with your clients, get some feedback, refine, create another prototype. Iterative process, fairly simple, okay? Let's look at another company's look at this, okay? So prototype, build a quick design and working model, test the prototype, validate, is it ready for production? No, okay, get some more requirements, analyze, go back and create another prototype, okay? So it's just a different view of it, but it's the same general idea. Here's another one, okay? Brainstorm, what are the requirements? Develop, document, and prototype a design through iterations, demo, and feedback. So they're kind of creating a loop within here. Then they even go to things called QA or quality assurance to help figure out bugs and defects. And then eventually, when it gets through that process, deploy it and release it to market, right? So these are, again, different companies' versions of an iterative design process. Now, some of them are a little prettier than others, right? So let's take a look at, whoops, at, for example, this one. Okay, so maintenance, support, product conceptualization, architecture, design, and prototype, development testing, deployment, product development, life cycle. Okay, you sometimes hear that term, life cycle. Okay, and then there's another one, it's kind of the same idea. Okay. So what you want to know again is that this iterative cycle-based system is very much a part of modern software development. Once the prototype is in place, we start testing, getting that feedback. 
Failing to include the end user in that feedback loop can lead to several problems. One, the end product doesn't meet requirements. So your client, who will be paying for this, by the way, will say, no, thank you, not going to pay for it. It might be inappropriate. And I don't just mean like it's going to offend them, but they might say, you know what, this product you made for us isn't at all going to work with our system. It might have a bias towards the developer and not the end user. And I think even you could recognize that, that sometimes when you write software, you're writing it for you, okay? And that is a bias, right? So you want to try and downplay that bias as much as possible. Like, well, I prefer orange buttons. Well, no, but your client preferred silver buttons. So maybe you should err on the side of your client there. So feedback with developers, users, hardware, software, all within this computer system that we started with, sometimes is now summarized as just information technology. That's a very broad term, IT, that is used now, has probably been used in the last 20 years exclusively. The actual definition that I found online, the use of any computer storage networking or other physical devices infrastructure or processes to create, process, store, secure, and exchange all forms of electronic data. That definition is ginormous if you think about it. That in a lot of ways describes everything in this building. Okay? It's huge, that definition, right? So, there is actually a social and ethical consideration that isn't part of that. That the IB, if you remember yesterday in the IB's description, is something that you should be thinking about. What are the social and ethical concerns? Okay, one concern might be the rate at which technology is being introduced. That it might not be tested properly. Not that we can introduce new technology, but more of a deeper question, should we introduce new technology? So, for example, air traffic control. If they put in technologies before it's sufficiently tested, that could result in something catastrophic in an air traffic control system. The ultimate fear is that people will create systems that will essentially be better than humans and therefore replace us. The fear of Skynet and things like that. You guys know Skynet? Anyone know what Skynet? Okay. All right. Um, the fact is computers are better at humans, at stuff that we find hard. Humans find math, in general, hard. Not necessarily you, but in general, humans find math hard. And as a result, computers are actually very good at math. Stuff that we find easy, what I'm literally doing right now, walking, is actually really hard for computers. I watched that show, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Anyone watch the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show? It's not that good, but it's on right now. I know, you get started on a show and then you realize this show is crap, but oh man, I'm in it now. What am I going to do? I feel bad about it. Anyways, the, the latest plot twist is they've made these things called life model decoys, which are essentially robots that look like humans and walk around. And this is supposed to be set in the, Mar the same universe that they make the Avengers movies and all that. So in other words, it's like, like us, right? It's like supposed to be like happening now. But the reality is we're nowhere near having robots walk around and look like humans. It's not even close. <laughs> the actual walking part is actually extremely difficult. Other things aren't. Now, a better show that I watched, isn't said in this, is Westworld. Any of you watched the Westworld show? That's a good show, okay? And in that one, similarly, they have robots walking around acting like humans. Now, it's not said in our reality, but nonetheless, stuff that we find easy, Walking, writing, that kind of stuff. Interpreting what people say and doing on it. Like, hey, buddy, can you do that? Or cast me outside, how about that? We know what that means. <laughs> Is that right? Did I get it right? Did I get it even close? The computer totally misinterprets that. And you may actually recall back at the beginning of grade 10, I proved that to you with simple things like Einstrillings. Paris in the, the spring. You remember that one? All the way back in grade 10? Or the uh, piece of text that you shouldn't be able to read. To us, that's actually easy. 
To the computer, heuristic algorithms to decipher that is harder. But to us, things like doing logarithms by hand, it's hard. Computer, easy. So the fear is that technology will slowly start to even out. And that's happening, right? Like stuff that the computer did find hard, it's now getting better at. The fear is that eventually it will get to the point where the computers can do everything we can do. Can think like we can, can walk and talk like we can. And then the result is, why are we needed anymore? Isn't that the basis of the whole Ultron movie with the Avengers? Yeah. So that's a concern. That's a big one. Smaller concerns. Digital addictions. Gaming addictions. Space monster shoot up addictions. The so-called digital treadmill. That you can't get away from your technology. Try it. Put your phone aside for a week. Don't go online for a week. Some of you It'll be like, you will actually feel that physical pain of that. I, I guarantee that will happen. You will actually feel what addicts call the stages of withdrawal. Like, it will be a physical pain that you will feel. Okay? The term digital citizenship. I bet you you heard in middle school. Be a good digital citizen. Don't be that crappy Facebooker who... Beyonce, you, that performance was terrible, right? Which is what my wife did literally right at the Grammys because she was being a bad digital citizen because she just decided she didn't like Beyonce that night and thought that performance was... Um, no, she thought it was a little too grandiose, like a little too I'm Beyonce, everyone love me. Um, whatever, that's her opinion. I thought it was nice. Um, all right. Cyberbullying, social networking. These are the kinds of things that we can consider when we're talking about the ethical and social concerns of not just can we make this technology, but should we make this technology, okay? It's at least a broad umbrella of terms that you should be familiar with, and you could absolutely get an IB question like this, so you should be prepared to at least write about it, okay? All right, I think that will be a good stopping point for today, and we'll pick up on that tomorrow.